The news begins in West Africa, where the conflict between the Nigeria Labour Congress and the Labour Party has taken another turn as members of the NLC on Wednesday picketed the headquarters of the party in the Itako area of the Federal Capital Territory in Abuja. The union members, led by the acting chairman of the Political Commission of the Congress, Theophilos Unduabuaku, demanded the immediate resignation of Julius Abure as the national chairman of the party on the grounds that he was not properly elected as the national chairman of the Labour Party. The NLC Political Commission chairman also claimed that a planned convention of the party under the leadership of Abure is an illegal one. So now, to discuss this, I am joined by the Labour Party's deputy governorship candidate in Edo State, Monday Marwa. Hello, Mr. Monday, are you there? We will definitely bring our guest as Moni Marwa to talk to us about that later on in the course of the bulletin. But then let's take you through security matters now. Delta State House of Assembly has condemned in very strong terms the killings of 16 soldiers at Okwama community in Ugeli South local government area of the state. The condemnation came following a motion raised at plenary session presided over by the Speaker, Emma Motimi Guo, under matters of urgent public importance by the member representing Ugeli South state constituency, Festus Utwama. The lawmakers enjoined the state governor to constitute commission of inquiry to investigate and unravel the immediate and remote causes of the crisis between Ukwama community in Ugeli South and Okoloba community in Bomadi local government area. Deeply commiserate with the families of the slain soldiers and the Nigerian army. Call on the governor of Dalton State, His Excellency Rajan Monel, the Sheriff Francis of Ophel of Borori, to urge relevant government security agencies to investigate, arrest, and prosecute all those who carry out these justice acts in line with the political laws of the states. Constitute the Commission of Inquiry to investigate and unravel the immediate and remote causes of the crisis between Okwama community in Ogeni South and the Kuluba community in Bomani local government areas. And put in place measures to protect the elderly men, women, children, and vulnerable persons who have suffered untold ash and loss of property and their livelihood in the Kwama community. Say aye. For updates on this, I am joined by our correspondent, Austin Azu. Austin Azu, um, it's a pleasure having you around. Now, um, we have actually heard divergent uh, reports from members of the Okoama community and the Nigerian army as to what might have triggered the attack on the military personnel. But a lot of people still want to know was the attack a retaliation of a previous aggression um, against members of the community? And those who attacked the military personnel, are they irate youths or mercenaries? Uh, we'd like to know those two um, issues. Well, first and foremost, good evening to you. Uh, but of course, you should know that the reason why most of these issues are coming up is because of the uh, manner at which the attack was carried out. Uh, obviously speaking, from what we gathered so far, there was uh, a lingering crisis between Okoloba community and that of uh, Okoma community. So these people, they came in uh, with the intention of a uh, broke high peace between these two communities. And from the report we gathered was like, after they came to the community, they had a very robust discussion. So on their way out, so they were attacked. And that was very unfortunate. And everyone condemned that particular attack. So for us to begin to find out 
how, where, and the method at which it was carried out. I think uh, that is why everybody is trying to come out to, uh, you know, prevail on the president, um, call on the state governor to come together to enable them come out with a clean uh, investigation of what really transpired. Because from what the people said and what the army they are saying at this point in time, we seem not to have a very good point to understand what really transpired. So by the time we, we are able to have the panel of inquiry that will go into details of what really transpired and how these operations were carried out, I think we'll be able to find out a very clear slate of what transpired and how it was meted out on that very day. Okay, um, what has happened has happened, but then a lot of people have asked why soldiers were the ones deployed to respond to a distress call instead of the police, probably a neighborhood watch or some other security outfits. Uh, has there been any clarification or response from the police department um, in, within that jurisdiction to this heinous crime? Well, when you talk about this uh, distress call, uh, of course, the army, they, they were JTF, the Joint Tax Force, so is a combination of uh, all the security outfits. So they are actually on, on patrol duty. So anyone, anybody can call on them because of the kind of uh, formation they have. So there's no need of course saying whether it's the responsibility of the police or the responsibility of the army. But however, uh, the police have not been able to give us a clear understanding of what really ha happened. Because as we speak at the moment, the place is a red zone. So nobody can actually go in there to go and do any investigation. Uh, the last time we went there, the CP was there. The other head of uh, military personnel were equally there. But any, uh, journalists were not allowed to have, gain access into the community. Even the governor could not even assess the community. So it means at this point in time, the army have said that uh, anybody found on that community, probably the person might likely going to be an enemy or against them, or might actually, they don't, they don't want to know in as much they are concerned, they want to ensure that that place is safe and calm before anybody can assess that place so that it will not lead to uh, cross-firing of any attempt. Uh, Austin, so Austin Azu, sorry, sorry, I may need to come in here. You said even the governor of the state was not allowed um, to gain access into the community. This is more or less the chief security officer of the state. So it couldn't, uh, it wasn't given the recourse or the access to go into the community to do um, a personal assessment or whatever it is that happened within that community. Is that what this means? Yes, the governor actually went to Bomadi. So I don't have I don't know the details of what transpired, but after meeting with the JTF at the Bomadi Jetty, so he made a U-turn back. So he didn't embark on that journey. So it means he might have been, you know, advised not to go before he left that place. So the next day he went to the villa to meet the president. So the governor did not assess the place, he was unable to go to that place based on the security advice he got or probably based on his personal decision not to visit the community to get the first-hand information. But he was briefed by the, JT, uh, by the JTF and after the briefing, I believe he got what he needed that he wanted before he left that particular day for the presidency. Okay, um, in reaction, the president, Abola Tinubu, has assured um, communities, uh, members of the community, most especially in Okoma, that uh, there won't be reprisal attacks. But then we saw some videos of security personnel scurrying up to you to Nasaba and a community yeah. leader on the condition of an anonymity uh, accusing the military of carrying out mass arrests and killings. So can you confirm or debunk news or reprisal attacks by any army personnel? Or maybe that was a, a separate situation that probably did happen? Yes, on that very on the very day the governor went to the jetty to go and get the first hand information, we probably had uh, some fracas, uh, insecurity concerns in the state capital here, where we have some group of persons who happen to be Okada riders. They had a clash with the they had a clash with the tax force. So based on that, lives were lost, property, what millions of naira were destroyed. So these were yeah, just uh, issues that cropped up in Asaba that very particular day. But however, on the issue of the Okwama community. Uh, what might likely be happening right now, I believe the security agencies, particularly regarding the army, are not taking it lightly with any of these uh, communities because their surveillance are there and their, pres their full presence on ground, they scare people away. The residents, I will speak at the moment, uh, I think they, they will not be able. I, I'm not thinking, I've spoken with some of them. They have been you know, uh, head hostage in their houses. They can't go out. They can't go to the market. They can't go to the farm. As we speak at the moment, there's possibility of hunger in those neighboring communities, like communities like uh, uh, Akubene, 
community like uh, Baigolo, community like Bomadi, and the neighboring communities as well. Because the presence of the army in those, var in those various communities, you know, send a strong message. Because if you watch the waterways, for instance, for you to assess uh, Okoma community, you must pass through the waters. Either you pass through the Bomadi houses or you pass through the Okwagbe houses. So if you are passing through the Bomadi houses, definitely we must, pass, we must pass through the waters. And you know these communities are surrounded with water. So the people can no longer go for their fishing activities because if you're on the river and you see the heavy presence of security personnel, definitely you will be scared. So the fishermen and those who are farming in the coastal line will not have that privilege for them to farm and have their business done the way it ought to be. So as we speak at the moment, I think there's need for intervention for agencies and governments to supply relief materials to those uh, other communities that are that those other communities are surrounded by, uh, close to Okwama community because the presence of the security has scared most of them away. So I think this time around they need food for them to eat now. Well, we know that um, the president, Blatinumbu, the governor of the state, I'm sure if a boy worry, uh, even the state assembly have now called for a thorough investigation of the matter. And we hope that the truth will be unraveled in no time. Uh, Austin Azu, thank you so much for sharing these uh, details with us. You're most welcome. We now go back to the story we told you earlier about um, the National uh, Labour, the Nigerian Labour Congress, rather, picketing the headquarters of the Labour Party I'm in Utaku area of the Federal Capital Territory in Abuja, demanding the resignation of the chairman of the party, that is um, Julius Aburi. And right now, I'm being joined by Labour Party's deputy governorship candidate in Edo State, Monde Mawa, and he'll be talking to us more about this. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Monde Mawa, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and good evening to all Nigerians and people all over the world. Oh, cool. Now, uh, yet again, the national chairman of the Liberal Party, Julius Abure, is in the eye of the storm, this time propelled by the National Liberal Congress. Uh, is it true that he was not properly elected as the party's chairman? That is not, that is not correct, to my opinion. That is not correct. Uh, you will be shocked that this is coming from me and uh, considering my position about Julius Abure's several months in the past. But you see, notwithstanding the running issue between some of us and Julius Aburi, we must still tell the world the truth. It is not correct that Julius Aburi was not properly elected as the national chairman of the party. He has been, he has been, he has been acting in that capacity for a long time now until the court restrained him on the 5th of April, 2003, before that restraining order was restored back on the sixth of this month. So, effective from on the sixth till now, Abure has been the Abure has been the legitimate chairman of Labour Party. So that that position that he was not properly elected as the national chairman of Labour Party is not correct. It is wrong. And that is a false allegation from anywhere. Uh, clearly so. He, was, he has been the chairman since 2021, unchallenged and unopposed. But then why is it that um, the plot to unseat him now is thickening? It has happened the last few months, and now we're seeing the NLC come out to say that he needs to resign. What is the problem? Well, I think uh, NLC, under the leadership of Joe Aichero, I have stated this some time ago in on this same program that, as far as I'm concerned, Nigeria has become a political party leader, no longer a union movement leader. Because, and that is why it's no longer being taken serious by the government when it's demanding for anything under the guise of the Nigerian workers. Now, we have not seen this kind of rascality from a union leader, not even the, 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 the civilized country that they, they claim they are copying from. How will you go to a party secretariat and bring down the gates in, 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 in a commando style? I mean, that is totally, it should be condemned by all lovers of peace. It should be condemned by all lovers of uh, due process. If they have any issue against Abure, just like we have been doing over the past period of time now, that Abure has some questions to answer. Then we went to court. There are court there. If you are dissatisfied by a condom of anybody, you go to your approach court. That is what is done in a civilized climate. And Nigeria all should not be different. 
the Nigerian Labour Party or Nigerian Labour Congress should not portray us like an uncivilized people to the to the world. For crying out loud, we are civilized people. Why would they go to the 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 the, 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 the party secretary, national secretariat? So if they have issue with Abu Ray, they should maybe if, if they feel it's a criminal matter, they should go to the police. If they feel it's a civil matter, they should file an action in court and let the due process to be to be to be followed. For the fact that I have been a, I've been part of the other group who have been fighting Abu Ray for the past some time over some. Uh, some conduct that I, 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 I do not feel satisfied with does not mean I should condone or praise some act of uncivility or, or some act of illegality. So what was done today, to me, is nothing short of illegality. Okay, now, now, now the NLC, I'd like to pick you up on this. The NLC political chair, uh, commission chairman, that's Teofilo Zundabaku, claimed that a, a planned convention of the party under the leadership of Aburi it's an illegal one. And he said that that particular convention is aimed at re-electing him as the sole administrator of the party. So is that a true picture, or you see that as a threat to the growth of the party? I'd like to know. Now, my brother, the point is that is also not correct. The, the, as soon as Abure rolled out the, the program for the proposed uh, convention, the same NLT that is talking, talking today, they ran to court to get an injunction. Why that matter is it before court? Today they have decided to take the law into their hands. Don't forget, some time ago, the Apa uh, 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 Passion got an order of court against Aburi. This system NL, this the crops of NLC uh, members that are coming up to say all, all sorts of rubbish today came up on national television to say that order we got from the federal high court was uh, was uh, they, there was the name they, they described it was a, a market side injunction. Thank you. That was the name they used for it. And then they came to the world and told the world that they are in support of Abure and that Abure is the chairman of the Labour Party. Then today, few months after, the same NLT are now coming today to say, well, Abure is no longer a chairman. That is to tell you the kind of people they are. And that is, that is why the Nigerian government can no longer take NLC under the leadership of Joe Ajero seriously. I think what I will say first is Joe Ajero should resign as a, as, as a labor union leader. Now and come and join full politics. Let us know he's not a politician. Okay, so there's there's this particular um, excuse or allegation, whichever way you choose to take it, that um, the current uh, labor leader, that is Joe Ajero, is planning or hoping to be the chairman, the national chairman of the party. And that might be one of the reasons why we're seeing. Um, some, so, some sort of agitation on the part of the members against the leadership of Julius Abure. Is there any truth to that? It, it, well, it is obvious from the from, from their conduct. Abde, Oshomole was once comrade Adam Oshomole, who is now a senator, was once a labor leader. I think it was under his leadership that the labor party today was vetted. But we never saw something like this under his leadership as NLC president. Uh, this man was one time NLC president. Uh, this man from, I think, from Kaduna, uh, the one that handed over to Ajero. We never saw this kind of display. I think if Ajero, from what he has displayed today, it will not be wrong. Anybody saying that he's interested in becoming becoming Labour Party chairman will not be wrong. Okay. After that, we advise him. If he's no more interested in politics than unionism, he should resign. Okay. That's all. He should not mix the two together. It should not be a labor union at night and their political party member during the day. It should not miss the vote. You are either a union leader or a political uh, leader. So Joe Ajero should let us know which one he wants to do. Okay, well, uh, we've also heard that um, the Labour, um, the Nigerian Labour Congress has come out to say that they own the Labour Party and not the leadership of the Labour Party itself. But that's going to be a um, discussion for um, some other time. Uh, Monday Marwa, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. We now tell you that the president of the Zimbabwe Manas Federation, Enrieta Rushwaya, has been arrested for fraud after allegedly attempting to sell three mines she does not own. Police spokesperson Paul Nyati said Rushwaya was taken into police custody after a complaint had been received about mining transactions. She appeared in court on Wednesday and the state prosecutor opposed bail. Last year, Roshwaya was convicted of trying to smuggle gold 
worth over $330,000 out of Zimbabwe in 2020. She's well, she was a central figure in the Gold Mafia documentary, which exposed how huge amounts of gold had been smuggled out of Zimbabwe to the United Arab Emirates. Still in Zimbabwe, President Emmanuel Nangagwa has received 250,000 tons of wheat donated by the Russian government and 23,000 tons of fertilizer provided by the Oralchem Oralkali group of Russian companies. Russia's ambassador to Zimbabwe, Nikolai Krasilnikov, said on Wednesday that the grain transfer is humanitarian assistance. Last year, Russia announced a free grain transfer program to African countries. Aside from Zimbabwe, the program also covers Burkina Faso, Mali, Eritrea, Somalia, and the Central African Republic. The aid comes as Zimbabwe and several other Southern African countries battle food shortages due to an ongoing drought attributed to the El Nino weather phenomenon. El Nino shifts weather patterns leading to droughts or excessive rainfall. To the southern parts of the continent, we'll tell you that South Africa's president, Sir Ramaphosa, has acknowledged that the country still lags behind in upholding the constitution. However, there is still progress to be made. He said the government has made strides in advancing human rights since the dawn of democracy in the country and also shown its commitment to the rule of law and to the protection of human rights. Bongani Siziba gives us the story. In a world where the fight for human rights continues to be a pressing issue, leaders are gathered here to discuss the importance of upholding these fundamental rights, shed light on the significance of human rights and the Constitution. Human rights are the basic rights that all human beings should have. Human rights embody the key values of our society, such as equality, dignity, and fairness, and they also define our nationhood. Ramaphosa also reaffirmed the government's commitment to upholding human rights. We have put in place are the promotion of access to information act which gives effect to Section 32 of the Constitution, the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, which gives effect to Section 33, and the promotion of equality and promotion and prevention, rather, of Unfair Discrimination Act, which gives effect to Section 9. To give effect to Section 9.2 of the Constitution relating to the measures of redress for previously disadvantaged people in our country who passed the Employment Act here. We also passed the Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment Act and other such legislation to promote equality, full equality when it comes to opportunities, the economy, and many other areas that affect the lives of South Africa. We do not want to see the next 30 years not having been empowered as young people. 30 years from now, An intense dialogue but necessary is they seek to ensure the rights of all individuals are respected and protected. Questioning the status quo and challenging the existing narrative surrounding human rights in South Africa. The justice system has, hasn't done much because there are many cases that are still pending. There are many cases that they, they have emotionally drained people, but they are still pending. While or not, you, you see your litigant every day going up and down while you are being abused. The South African Constitution was signed into law 28 years ago, and the Ministry of Justice says it continues towards building a culture of human rights globally, which is a moral obligation as a country emerging from such a bitter past. As the country commemorates three decades of human rights, South Africans are reminded that these rights are universal and that they should be free to exercise them. However, the question is, has the country made progress in giving effect to the rights contained in the Constitution? In Boxbeck, Johannesburg, for News Central, Wangani, Siziba.
We now take you to East Africa, where at least 15 people, including senior officials, have been killed in an ambush in South Sudan. Officials say the commissioner of Boma County in Pibo was returning from a visit to a village on Tuesday when youths from a rival community attacked. He was killed along with his bodyguards and Boma's deputy army commander. A 2018 peace deal ended a five-year civil war in South Sudan, but several areas, including Boma County, have experienced outbreaks of ethnic violence. These have often been revenge attacks for cattle raids involving the Mule, Anyak, Noe, and Dinka ethnic groups. To the Horn of Africa, the Kenyan government says it will release some of the bodies belonging to victims of the Shakahola starvation cult next week. At least 34 bodies have been identified and linked to their families out of the hundreds that were exhumed last year. The bodies of 429 people, including children, were dug up from graves in Shakahola, a remote forest outside the coastal town of Malindi. Most showed signs of starvation and assault. Survivors and victims' families said self-proclaimed pastor Paul McKinsey encouraged members of his Good News International Church to move there and pray and prepare for the end of the world. Survivors say he instructed them to fast so that they could get to heaven. From other continents, Ireland's Special Erectors Joint Committee on Assisted Dying is set to publish its final report after months of hearing from both national and international experts. We understand the committee will recommend that the government legislates to introduce assisted dying in the state. This was a majority decision in which nine committee members voted in favor through three votes against, one abstained, and one was not present. The legislation would primarily apply to a person diagnosed with an illness or medical condition that is incurable, irreversible, progressive, and advanced, and will cause death within six months. This time limit is likely set at 12 months for neurodegenerative conditions. We also tell you that Leo Varadkar has announced that he's stepping down as Ireland's Prime Minister and leader of the Fine Gill Party in the governing coalition before the next general election. According to Varadkar, he is quitting due to personal and political reasons. Varadkar became Ireland's youngest uh, siege in 2017 when he became leader of Fine Gill. He currently leads the coalition government in Dublin along with Fianna Phil and the Greens. So I am resigning as president and leader of Fine Gael effective today and will resign as Taoiseach as soon as my successor is able to take up that office. I've asked our party general secretary and executive council to provide for the new leader to be elected in advance of the Ardesh on Saturday, April 16th, thus allowing a new Taoiseach to be elected when the doll resumes after the Easter break. Let's talk business now. Analysts have shown positive as Brent crude oil prices rise to $86 a barrel, signaling an upward trend. This development is seen as a potential catalyst for economic growth. However, it is crucial to emphasize the significance of responsible fiscal management. In the past, oil prices remained above $100 per barrel for an extended period, yet Nigeria failed to fully capitalize on the opportunity. Bolade Adbola, an oil and gas analyst at Chapel Hill Denham Securities, provided insights into why the current situation may differ during her appearance on the Business Edge show. We saw oil price, you know, such average oil price for 2022 was around $100 per barrel. And, you know, our production was quite low in that period. However, if we look at from 2022 to 2023, we've seen an improvement from about 1.38 million, average of 1.38 million barrels per day to one, about 1 1.4 million barrels per day in um, 2023. And if we look at the average production in 2024, um, it's over in 1.56, you know, 1.59 um, million barrels per day. That's just January and February. So we've seen some improvement in oil production. So we believe that, you know, this, um, unlike in 2022, where, you know, we are able to take 
um, advantage of higher oil prices is really that this year is going to be a different one, given that you know, the Talking sports now, Nigeria's current number one ranked professional golfer, Francis Epe, who led the assembly of top players that have enlisted to feature at the launch of Acropolis Golf Club from April 5 in Anambra State. Other players expected include Sunday Olakbadi, a uh, former Nigeria number one and recent winner of Libreville Open in Gabon, Gift Willy, the 2023 CIO Open winner, and Oche Odor, the most decorated Nigerian professional golfer. The organizers have stated that the caliber of players showing up for the inaugural event have been carefully selected and their presence and high quality of their game will add value to the overall objective of the Acropolis Resort. In the meantime, Natasha Gerardine Conan of Cote d'Ivoire will officiate the African Games women's football final between Ghana and Nigeria. Assisting her will be Sakina Hamidu from Niger Republic as assistant one, Alice Umutesi from Rwanda as assistant two, and Raya Sise from Ethiopia as the fourth official. The Minister of Sports Development, Senator John Eno, has visited the team ahead of the final and charged them to retain the title. Nigeria's under-20 national women's team have had a flawless run to the final, winning all three games, scoring eight goals and, con and conceding none. On their part, the Ghanaians have won three matches and drawn one, scoring seven goals while conceding three. The final match is set to take place at the Cape Coast Stadium on Thursday, March 21, 2024. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, we we'll quickly take a look at some of our major stories. Nigeria Labour Congress has picketed Labour Party headquarters, demanded Aburi's removal. Zimbabwe mining boss has been arrested for alleged fraud. At least 15 government officials have been killed in South Sudan. You can send your advocates report to the WhatsApp number and email on your screen. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can also watch News Central Live on DSTV Channel 422, Star Times Channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Lipon Onobanjo.